Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Dr. Day and Dr. Tessie Rocha for inviting me to be here in this wonderful event. I want to reflect back on um, the memorand memorandum of understanding that Dr. DeVivo mentioned yesterday. As, as I recall, there was an addendum, and that addendum said that if Sally was either unwilling or unable to come back to New York, that you would take Dr. DeVivo and myself by 2023. Just saying. So... But it, um, in any sense, it's been a great um, day and a half so far, and I look forward to the rest of the day. And thank you, um, Tina and Richard, for setting me up so nicely to talk more specifically about exercise. So here are my disclosures. Um, but since yesterday, we talked about SMA as a slowly progressive disease, um, and I'd like to start there. Um, this paper was um, published by the Utrecht group, and they looked at a large um, cohort of SMA pa patients from young children to older adults and everywhere in between, and it's a cross-sectional study, but they evaluated them on both strength and function. The first two left figures are upper extremity and lower extremity strength, um, respectively, and the last figure is um, on the right is, is motor function. And they um, divided them by type. The orange and uh, red lines represent uh, the type three patients. The blue are the type two, and the one green line in the upper extremity category is the type one patients. But what I wanna highlight is that strength and function decline over time, or decline with age, since this is a cross-sectional study. And you, further, you could see where the slopes are more steep, um, sort of highlights the vulnerable periods um, for our patients with regards to strength and function. Similarly, um, we recently um, looked at uh, the longitudinal or the natural history um, uh, ambulatory function in SMA patients of all ages in our um, uh, in international SMA consortium network. And while uh, similar to the Dutch paper, there's a slow progression over time, What's important to note is that it depends on how old you are. So what we found is while there's a, a real slow progression over time, a few, you know, about 10 meters lost per year on the six-minute walk test, if you uh, focus in on the adolescents or the, the uh, 11 to 19-year-olds, that slope is much steeper. And so there are vulnerable periods and there is gradual loss of, of, of function. So what's the role of exercise? I know um, we've spoke about it a lot, and, and, and we know already that it's an integral part of rehabilitation care for all SMA patients. And in, in our standard of care document, we said that um, the purpose, the primary purpose is to maintain or possibly improve function, strength, range of motion, endurance, balance, activities of daily living, and participation in, in um, relevant activities. Um, and we, we know um, that there are benefits to exercise in the general population, and there's no reason to think that um, our SMA patients um, couldn't benefit from those as well if applied properly. But Dr. Butler coined this uh, phrase. Now, this is over 10 years old now. If exercise could be packed in a pill, it would be the single most widely prescribed and beneficial medicine in the nation um, because of, of all the wonderful benefits, right? So, and you can't, you know, open the New York Times on a Sunday and not see an ex, you know, an article that says exercise helps you know, cognitive function, you know, prevents all these comorbidities. And so how great would it be if we could just take a pill? But we can't, and so the challenge with the additional challenge with exercise is it requires that you do something. Um, <laughs> so, um, but exercise, just to sort of get into the weeds, could broadly be categorized into aerobic exercise generally and strengthening exercise. Aerobic exercise is something that gets your heart rate up, right? And um, uh, it usually in. in encompasses a functional activity like walking, running, cycling, swimming, um, anything like that. But 
when you do those activities, you're cer there's certainly a strengthening component to it. And strengthening um, involves some sort of range of motion. It, it could, could active, active assistive. There's different ways we, as we all know, we can do concentric or eccentric exercise or isometric exercise. And in all those domains, we could add resistance. And uh, we can't forget about strengthening, stretching, because in order to move in a range of motion, you need flexibility. So these are the general categories of exercise um, that are out there, but I just want to highlight there's a tremendous overlap. You can do one thing and cover several aspects of exercise. Some of the possible mechanisms that might um, help, uh, help uh, w w that might promote increases in function and strength in SMA patients is that it may reverse the effects of inactivity and disuse weakness, certainly. Um, the, our SMA patients um, can do less, so they do less, and so some of their weakness or their limited function could simply just be a consequence of, of not doing. Um, um, it could, also, on the other end of that, optimize their residual muscle function. Um, certainly, it, could, uh, it may play a role in mitigating the development of musculoskeletal changes, like Richard had highlighted, like contractures as such. And, and there's some evidence in the, in the, at least in the mouse models, that it might have a neuroprotective role. So in the mouse models, and I recognize that you say that, uh, understanding that the mouse doesn't necessarily translate to the human, but in mouse models, it's shown that it, that it, it reduces motor neuron death, um, and, and so it could play another role as well, a physiological role in SMA. Uh, the, these standard of care document is is, is like our Bible, um, and uh, Richard touched on it eloquently. And 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 I'm of course going to focus on the the physical therapy and rehabilitation working group in more detail. I think um, what Richard. Richard didn't mention is that the first step in coming to um, a consensus amongst the 13 experts um, was to first do a literature review. And um, we looked at our article, uh, we searched spinal muscular atrophy, rehab, PT, OT, exercise to find um, as much evidence in the literature to start our, to make the basis for our recommendations. And um, unfortunately, or fortunately, we, there were only 54 articles identified, 12 of which were related to interventions, which I'll focus on, on here. So there's not that much evidence. Um, here are those, uh, a few of those studies highlighted in the table, and what I want to uh, point out to you is that we also looked at the level of evidence from these recommendations, and, and unfortunately, the majority of them um, had low level of evidence, so they were either case studies or, or uh, opinion papers or observational studies, and only a, a few um, were um, well-designed controlled and possibly randomized. So um, more recently, um, um, Bart Bartles in Utrecht um, and I um, were bold enough to undertake a Cochrane review. And in hindsight, I don't know that I'd recommend it. It's really <laughs> painful. <laughs> Um, but an important process because it's really a, a really rigorous way of, of, of understanding the literature and the evidence. Fortunately or unfortunately, there's not that much out there in SMA. But anyway, we limited it to exer exer physical exercise training for type 3. Um, we included studies that were either randomized or quasi-randomized. They had to have a control group, and that control group could be placebo, it could be usual care, it could be a non-physical intervention, and it had to be at least 12 weeks in duration. For some reason, 12 weeks is the magic number for exercise trials across the board. I think they're based on the evidence in, in healthy populations that you should see um, an effect of exercise in 12 weeks, so um, 12 weeks has been adopted to a lot of um, disease states. So we ended up with only 11 studies um, for potential inc inclusion. Um, and they were all quite different. Some combined strength and aerobic exercise training. Some were just aerobic exercise. There was an aquatic therapy one, functional strengthening, and, and then there was a vibration study. 
So, um, but only one of those 11 studies were um, a randomized controlled study with a, a, a training group as a control group. So, what, I'll, what I like to do is, is to highlight that study and compare it to some of the other relevant studies that were included in the 11. So that one study was our study uh, that we... <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> it was a, a study that we, um, under the direction of Dr. DeVivo, that was uh, sponsored at the Depart by the Department of Defense. Um, um, and so the other study that I think is important to compare it to and adds to our understanding of the role of exercise was um, the study done by the Vissing Group in Denmark. And, and they're an extremely competent group with lots of experience in, in exercise study in, in neuromuscular disease. And with a, there's a body of literature from this group on, on exercise in neuromuscular disease um, that's worth looking into. Um, so uh, th these studies were published in the same year and were es essentially happening at the same time. Our study was a bit longer. Um, it was uh, six months with a 12-month extension, and their study was 12 weeks. Um, our, we had um, a bl uh, evaluator blinded randomized study. So um, Sally, when she was still with us in New York, was our blinded evaluator, um, it, it, um, and she knew nothing about the study design or the group assignment. The Madsen study was not blinded. Um, the intervention that we had had a both an aerobic and a strengthening component. Um, patients were given a recumbent bicycle to in their home. Um, and the goal, the target intensity exercise, which I'll talk a little bit more about, was um, uh, five times a week of, ex of aerobic exercise, three times a week of strengthening, and we had a lead-in period. We used the um, rate of perceived exertion as um, the target intensity. And so when patients were enrolled, they were either assigned to the uh, exercise group or the usual care group for the first six months, and then the usual care group was transitioned over for the remaining 12 months to exercise. In the Madsen study, they had a few healthy controls as, as a comparator group. They um, only had an aerobic component, and they uh, their program over 12 weeks was four times a week on an upright bike, and they, tar they determined the intensity based on their performance on their VO2 max. Um, uh, their max wattage on their VO2 max test. So our primary outcome measure was a six-month walk test distance, and um, uh, their uh, primary outcome measure was VO2 max and activities of daily living. So the results of our studies, uh, what I want to highlight here is that um, it, nobody started at 150 minutes five times a week. 150 minutes a week, th 30 minutes five times a week. So this is a representative subject here, um, and on the x-axis shows the number of weeks in the study, and the y is the no number of minutes of aerobic exercise per week, with the red line being the target of 150 minutes per week. And as you could see, it took almost six months to get to, to, to that 150 minutes per week, and only 50% of the people got to 150 minutes by six months. So we, we, were, we were very cautious about how we progressed um, the amount of exercise they could do. We, we never increased them more than 10% in, uh, in, and only once in a two-week period. Um, so unfortunately, our results were negative. So uh, there was no difference between the control group and the exercise group on any of the outcome measures. Our primary outcome measure is six-minute walk test or um, VO2 max or any of the other functional measures. However, when you looked at all the participants, so remember the usual care group transitioned over to the exercise group, they, um, 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 when you combine all of the patients that exercised for six months, there was a, a modest improvement in, in um, VO2 max or aerobic capacity um, that was found. So similarly in the Matson study, they, they started out with nine patients 
um, six SMA patients completed the, the study. Um, they did similarly have a, a, a modest improvement in VO2 max, but it came with a consequence. There was, uh, they reported that there was, their patients had severe fatigue um, as a result of the, the, the intervention. Um, so uh, they lost the three initial patients to uh, overwhelming fatigue, and the, the remaining patients complained that, that the, the intensity of the exercise was, they were incredibly tired and were having difficulties um, keeping up with their um, activities. So perhaps that's something to learn that, that m maybe progression is something we really need to focus on um, in how we approach um, patient care and exercise. To talk a little bit about our strengthening results, um, Strengthening was, uh, again, our target exercise intensity for strengthening was 90 minutes a week, so 30 minutes three times. And it was an individualized exercise uh, program that we gave to them and targeting about five to seven muscle groups in the upper and lower extremity. And um, as you can see um, in this similar graph as the previous one, they were, it, it, this was achievable. Um, they got to the intensity quite, uh, easily and were largely, this is a representative subject, but generally everybody was largely compliant with the strengthening exercises. And while there was no significant difference between the groups, um, the, 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 some of the measures, there was positive changes, and, and it wasn't statistically meaningful, but there was positive changes in some of our outcome measures like arm, leg, Hammersmith score. Um, six-minute walk test in the exercise group highlighted in black that wasn't seen in the control group. One of the other 11 studies that was um, uh, identified as potent for potential inclusion in this Cochrane review was a study that um, was led by um, Kristen Crischel and uh, Catherine Soboda, uh, um, where they looked at um, a home-based strengthening program in SMA patients where physical therapists went to the house and did um, strengthening exercises with nine patients um, over 12 weeks. And um, um, they found that it was well tolerated um, and there, there were no adverse events and there was, it was safe and feasible. Uh, unfortunately, there, uh, similar to our results, there was no um, um, improvement in strength or function. Um, that was uh, significant, but it wasn't necessarily powered to do so. I f this other, it's more recent article from Turkey, I think um, is, is interesting and supportive. This is, uh, f they studied five patients um, in, with arm cycling, so non-ambulant patients doing arm cycling um, for 12 weeks, their magic number 12 weeks. Um, um, and what they found is that SMA patients were able to um, exercise farther and um, longer um, on this upper extremity ergometer, but there were no improvements in motor function. Interestingly, they also looked at other biomarkers, um, biological biomarkers, um, and um, found no changes. I like this article. This wasn't that. This one um, didn't come up in our. Um, Cochrane Review as one of the 11, but uh, what I like about this is that it's innovative and creative and re references back to what um, Richard is highlighting, that it should be incorporated into sort of child-appropriate or life-appropriate activities. It's a study that looked at uh, power wheelchair soccer, and um, look, there were 30 participants, and a third of them, more than a third of them, had SMA, which I think is, is, is a testament to SMA patients, so there was what they, but they, what they looked at is met levels or meta, metabolic equivalents or, you know, um, activity and, and oxygen consumption and perceived exertion during these power wheelchair soccer games. And in fact, they, they found that there's a little bit of increase in, in, in met level and RPE during power wheelchair soccer. So, I think we, there's not much evidence to, we know there's limited evidence to rely on. And so as part of this um, standard of care um, consensus meeting and initiative is then we had to like put our expert hats on 
And we used the Delphi method to determine what topics were important, and then the second round was to rank them. And this is the um, results of, of the interventions and the ranking of interventions um, based on non-Sarah citizen walkers. And um, they're listed here from most important to least important, but I tell you, that was the biggest debate. Nobody, everybody said, but they're all important. Nothing is least important. So that, that took a couple of hours on a, on a phone call to say, but we have to rank them. So, so but uh, if we speak to, to, to Tina's point about having a toolkit, we do definitely have a toolkit of, of, of activities for exercise and interventions as well. Richard nicely pointed this out. Um, you know, as much as we want to say, and intuitively, you know, we want to believe, we know exercise has got to help. We see it, but we haven't yet really affirmed it. Um, but I think what we can affirm is that it's generally safe if administered um, properly. So based on those guidelines, based on the evidence, based on the expert opinion, based on uh, ex uh, our, that, we developed some guidelines. And so, um, and I know I won't spend too much time because uh, uh, Richard touched on it a bit, but in the standard of care guidelines, we said for strengthening, it should be minimal two to three times a week, optimal three to five times a week, um, perhaps on non-consecutive days, and then generally low reps, high reps, low load. Um, so the, the, with not the in purpose to build muscle, but to build strength. Um, similarly, the uh, aerobic exercise um, uh, recommendations were optimally 150 minutes per week. And that's based on the ACSM guidelines. So the ACSM guidelines says all Americans should exercise at that. I think the, from our experience, the, the sort of caveat would be that um, nobody should go from zero to 150. And it should really be a slow um, progression to, to get to that level of exercise. Um, um, some things to consider is you can alternate days, um, and you can, you know, you should definitely change it up. I think all of the general principles of exercise that we would apply to ourselves um, would, you would want to translate to your um, patients. This table highlights what Richard said about um, strengthening exercise and muscle groups. So generally speaking, for muscles that don't have, don't, can't, move against gravity throughout the full range, so a less than a three on the MRC score. Um, you want to uh, avoid concentric and certainly resistance with, con uh, you want to avoid eccentric exercise. And you know, concentric exercise is doable, but probably, and even with resistance, but probably in a gravity eliminated um, position. So triceps on the table with a weight might, uh, be a reasonable goal for that muscle group if it's weak. Generally, you know, anything is possible for those muscles that have um, gravity, uh, uh, can move against gravity in full range. Um, when we look at the cervical muscles, uh, our group um, said we didn't see the role of resistance, or we don't know what the role of resistance in cervical musculature might be. Um, and this again highlights the the aerobic exercise. Uh, minimally, it should be two to three times a week, where optimal should be three to five. With regards to intensity, the Omni scale is a good tool to give um, patients because we really want to make sure that they, you know, they're getting into the range that that might be helpful for them. The Omni scale is. Uh, was validated against the board. It's basically a pediatric version of the a perceived exertion scale. It's good for adults as well. And what I like is that they have the different versions of exercise, cycle, uh, walking, strengthening. Um, so uh, in terms of intensity for, for aerobic exercise, um, you could use perceived exertion um, or some more um, specific uh, guidelines like a target heart rate range, or if they've done a VO2 max test, some percentage of that, or some percentage of the wattage done on a max test. 
for strengthening, uh, you could use the same uh, parameters as well uh, of perceived exertion, um, but you could also use a percent of a maximum force um, as such. I think if you walk away with one um, thought, uh, it would be that slow progression is probably the best method. Um, and that you should certainly have a warm up and a cool down. Um, a, 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 to be aerobic exercise, it could be moderate to vigorous. Um, and you can, the progression could be alterations in the time you exercise or the speed or the resistance. Um, and uh, similarly, um, with resistive exercise, the progression could be in repetitions or in weight. A good, uh, important point to look for is um, um, looking for compensations. Cert certainly, you wouldn't want um, them to have uh, uh, alterations or compensations that are that um, as they're getting tired. That would uh, indicate that you need to um, change the number of reps or, reps or the resistance. Just to think. Um, Sort of broadly, um, for non-sitters, um, exercise largely has to incorporate some sort of assistive technology. Um, Richard highlighted the slings and springs. Um, this is another version of that. Certainly, aquatic therapy is, you know, where feasible, the best uh, thing for um, the weakest patients because they can move the most, right? And you're, you're, we're here in California. It's easier, I imagine, in sunny, warmer places than than colder places. And I, I recognize the challenges of on a family to get into a pool and and so forth. But ultimately, if possible, that's probably the best environment for the weakest patients. Um, for uh, uh, sitters, uh, er exercise should, as Richard had highlighted, be act uh, incorporated into activities of daily living and age-appropriate activities. Here's uh, um, on the left-hand side is the same little girl doing yoga, and um, this is her swimming. Um, and I have more videos of her as well, but. I think what's important to note here, she's a very good, she's a type two, um, but she has uh, um, flippers on, zoomers, whatever they're called. So she needs a little of assistance, but she does pretty well. Wait till you see her flip turn. You gotta watch it. She makes us all look bad. You see her, her flippers. Isn't that good? <laughs> So <laughs> here's a, um, sitters can also, you know, this new step uh, device, uh, I find a lot of SMA patients really like. You can change the, uh, the contribution of the legs and the arms, and um, I find even weaker SMA patients could do it. You could also do um, hip hop class. Here she is, this is her big sister. Uh, sort of like the power wheelchair you know, activity. Certainly she's getting her heart rate up and having fun. Um, so, <laughs> they're good. Um, for walkers, I got more videos, that's why I don't want to run out of time. So, <laughs> uh, for walkers, you know, the adaptive, you know, upright activities, so, you know, tennis, swimming has a, takes on a new form here. Um, because now he can incorporate like resistive exercises and challenges to um, his activity. He also plays sled hockey, and so in sled hockey, I learned that they have a you know a stick and they propel themselves. Sometimes they have a pusher, which is important, but they're still doing a fair amount of work. And you know, even to be a goalie is no small um, um, task. So I thought I would. Um, just show a quick case study, and, and um, I, I, Sally uh, put this together for our course last year um, of a patient of ours. And I, but I think it highlights. I'm, I'm disclosure. She's like the exemplary. This little girl and their family are exemplary in their exercise program. But I think it's a, a, a good um, example. So she, with regards to strengthening exercise, she exercises does strengthening exercises two to four times a week. She uses the Omni scale and, and, and it's at about a four or somewhat easy. Um, 
for about 30 to 50 minutes, and, and here are some of the exercises. She does um, overhead shoulder presses. You could see her using the mirror to um, uh, make sure that there are no compensations and there might be a little active assistive. Um, she also does um, some overhead throwing and catching, and she alternates um, the type of ball she uses. So, you know, a, a beach ball versus a soccer ball, um, having different, or to a two pound medicine ball, which is a progression getting harder. Um, and then she does uh, the fly, the zoom ball pulley system um, as exercise. And she's sitting on a, on a, smushy thing so she's this is all a lot of core a lot of arms a lot of everything and um, she also does other overhead activities at lifting um, things up to sh chest height to different heights um, and different weights for different reps she also um, does lower extremity strengthening activities at the same frequency intensity and duration um, so she's half kneeling here. I'm not, not sure if you can see it over a roll. Um, and she's throwing a bean bag. This is where she um, walks over the through a ladder, and so she has to step up higher as she as she goes ahead and does it. And then she does bridging with sometimes with a resistance, with a, a, a um, weight on her belly. And she also does toe taps in the parallel bars and st all sorts of um, walking activities. She's unable to walk without um, loft strands and braces. And But in these, she also does walking activities like she does speed versus distance. Some of the trunk activities, strengthening activities she does, she um, does the, the, I always see this on Nike Training Club, but then nobody's there to do it with me. So, um, but uh, abdominal twists, um, getting her obliques. For aerobic activity, so she is a swimmer. This video you saw before, um, she's been in competitions it's been adapted for her. She dives in from sitting. Um, you've seen that video. She's she's got the backstroke. She's got freestyle. She really is um, a superstar. And it's been swimming a long time. Um, it's a family affair. You saw her doing wheelchair hip hop with her sister. This is her mom. She also does um, uh, the uh, new step about once a week for about 45 minutes at a low intensity, so a, a three out of 10. Um, so she's going for sort of the longer um, uh, aerobic, low, low load aerobic um, activity. And she also does rowing um, at a higher intensity for a shorter duration. So, and that certainly, um, as I learned, rowing is all legs, so she's definitely getting a lot of legs. You think it's arms, but it's a lot of legs and trunk. And she does cycling. There's dad and sister. Um, and she does that at least 10 to 30 minutes a week. She's grown up on her bike. So she's really exemplary as just as a case ex study. And so what I'd like to close with is that we we know we've heard so so and it was so eloquently put yesterday that function improves with treatment, and we're really just on the horizon as to as to um, what else we can do with treatment and different the different therapeutic um, interventions that are out there. Um, but I guess we we really. We, we don't know if there's an added benefit with exercise to the disease-modifying therapies. Both the SMN um, protein uh, upregulators and the muscle-targeted therapeutics. And so maybe as a group and in a community, we can approach this in a very systematic way. To the, the, uh, uh, the ship has sailed in terms of understanding the role of exercise in the natural history in SMA, right? That's, we'll, we'll never know. 
Um, but maybe at this sort of crossroads, it's an opportunity to really understand um, what, what we believe to be true is uh, the impact of exercise in combination with, with um, therapies on our SMA patients. So with that, I'll say thank you. I'm, I certainly want to acknowledge um, the PNCR and the uh, leadership, Dr. DeVivo, Dr. Darris, Dr. Finkel, Dr. Day, um, uh, the International SMA Consortium, um, my colleagues at Columbia, and um, the Dr. Day and Sally and Dr. Tessie Rocha for inviting me. Thank you. Lots and lots of questions again. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you for submitting them. Honestly, this is great. And I do hope you get a chance to speak to one of us before the day ends today. Um, one of the good ones I thought was, how do we avoid fatigue and injure um, muscle or neurons, but still maximize their function while instructing them to do their exercise program? Sure. I think we can learn from our lessons, right? So, so um, from our lessons, from our studies, that certainly um, using an omniscale to understand their perceived exertion um, to understanding their progression, to, to progressing them slowly. That's one um, uh, approach. Um, and to, to getting their feedback. So, so, you know, understanding their response to the exercise and then, you know, modifying it in real time um, going forward. So, so, so um, you start with a, some sort of recommendation based on their performance. So it's five to ten minutes of cycling exercise just you know a, a few times a week and you should say you shouldn't feel exhausted after you do it you might feel a little tired but you should be able to recover and then you, you sort of monitor it um, along the way with very gradual increases in intensity as they go forward so do you have a target omni that you would recommend trying to keep them at an intensity level I think you we we our study was designed to work between four and six so um, I think, um, which is like somewhat easy to somewhat hard, um, but I definitely would err on the lower side. I mean, we do, we do maximal exercise tests as part of our other studies, part of our exercise study and our current studies, and so you can do a max test and not have long-term negative consequences, but so, so you could do maximal exercise, it's not that that you're going to do long-term harm. It's just not something that's, that is sustainable and should be done in the right context. So when they come to do max tests with us, we make sure they're rested the night before and that they don't have anything planned for the, the evening after, so, or afternoon after. Thank you. Um, you had the great case study of a sitter and show great pictures of a walker. Do you have any... Um, suggestions for exercises or how to get aerobic and strengthening um, done for a patient like our patient Lucy yesterday who's more of a severe spectrum type one. I think the two things we could re rely on the most are the pool, which I, I realize is not such an easy task, but the pool is where they, they can move and do the most, but also slings and springs. I think uh, the, the, the putting them in a position where there's gravity eliminated and actually some sort of frictionless or friction, reduced friction environment, um, those, those activities are possible. So, um, and I, in that condition, getting your heart rate, doing aerobic exercise, it doesn't take much, right, to, to, to have a, um, like an exchange of a ball or, or a riding activity, or stuff. It, it, it's demanding on them. So it, it, um, it just requires uh, equipment or adaptation. Last one I thought was good as well. Any strategies for pain management while exercising? Any muscle spasms or cramps or how to help manage that? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a, a lot of, um, I haven't had a lot of complaints of, of, of muscle spasms with exercise. Um, Certainly, pain after exercise uh, is is something that needs to be addressed, and I, I I would certainly treat the the underlying problem, but maybe reflect back and see if is it a form problem? Like, are they doing some activity that 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 is out of form? That's that is in is 
causing the pain. So get to the bottom of, 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 of the dysfunction. I saw, if, if, is their posture good? Is it too much resistance? So um, I, I, that would be my approach. Thank you so much. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.